Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of LJ Hutchin Ministries. Uh, I'd just like to thank you for being on here and uh, today I'm going to do the part two, Genesis part two, the second part of the Bible study. And I actually started last week and uh, <clears throat> today I want to talk to you about some attributes of God. I uh, left you with that question last week. Uh, what was some of God's attributes? What are some of His powers? And uh, folks, I just don't think we ever know the full power of our God. I really don't think we ever know the full power of it, probably until we get to heaven. But uh, today I want to share with you. <coughs> excuse me. Today I want to share with you some of them that I found in Scripture. But uh, what a wonderful God we serve, folks. And. Uh, you know, if we just take our time and, and study the Bible and, and seek His Word and how He will just open up to you through His Word. And uh, the Bible is the final authority, for, uh, folks, in life. It's just the final authority. And, uh, I don't care what you, what's going on in life. The Bible is always the final authority. So uh, <clears throat> I want to go ahead and get started. Uh you will go ahead and turn back, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So as you can see, I'm still in verse 1 uh, on Genesis, but I will... I, said last week I'd probably be three videos in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, but I am going to get out of Genesis verse 1 uh, starting next week. But now, and now as I begin this lesson, I want, to, I want to spend some time on the word God, the capital G-O-D in this verse. You know, many people have all kinds of uh, ideas about God. How many of us out there have ever heard the expression or even used it? The man upstairs or somebody up there is watching me. <clears throat> uh, that puts God so far beneath what he really is, folks. You know, I think we have to remind ourselves that yes, he is a friend of sinners. He's the one who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He's the God in spite of his sovereignty that is a God of love and grace. And all these other things that we're going to look at at this lesson, we're going to look at the attributes of God. So, what I want us to learn in this lesson is, He's that kind of God we can perfectly be comfortable with in placing all our faith and what he has said. You know, people can't get to seem to get the idea that what God has said we can believe. It. You know, there's folks out there that just, they just don't get it. Uh, the Bible is not a book of myths or a book that was put together, as some people have said, as the Jews sat around the campfire, as their ancient campfires, as some people like to put it. That's what some people like to to say who say that the Bible was uh, written by Jews that just sat around by the campfire and wrote. But that's not what it is. Peter, in his epistle, says that holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Not just in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, over and over, he makes it so clear that everything he wrote was by re revelation by the ascended Christ. When the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, it was all by Holy Spirit inspiration. Every word from the Bible, folks, from cover to cover, is the Word of God. And we can believe it, because it's proven itself over and over. There's no other book ever that has proven itself over and over as the Bible has. Alright, the first thing I like to point out in this lesson is that God has these certain attributes. 
And like I said, I won't be able to name all of them because I, I, I shouldn't even say all of them because I don't think we can name all of God's attributes, His powers. And I am going to share some with you today. Uh, I think it's a good idea that we remind ourselves from time to time that God is sovereign. He is absolutely sovereign. And there is no one above him. He never he never had to go to somebody someone else for advice or for questioning. He is absolute in his sovereignty. Secondly, we can say God is immutable. What do I mean by immutable? It means he's unchangeable. The best verse in the Bible that supports this is in the book of Hebrews, where it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed in the past. He has never changed as of today. And he will never change in the eternity future because he is immutable. What God laid down at the beginning are still applicable today. God hasn't changed his attitude towards sin simply because it's a later time in human history and times has changed. He is immutable. And these things that he declared back in the Old Testament are still the same in his sight today. And they will be in the future. If he tarries, if he tarries because God changes not, God is always the same. So just in my lifetime and my generation, I have seen things change. I've seen the world change, the people change. Um, but God don't change, folks. You know, he does, he's immutable. He does not change. Uh, most of us have probably had an experience with somebody at one time or another where you could trust them with anything. Maybe sometime years later you found that you couldn't trust them any longer. Well, that very person, that very person could also be ourselves. What happened to this person? you could trust. Well, they changed. They changed in their attitudes and they are not immutable. But God is. So God never changes. Alright, so God is sovereign. That's number one. He is the supreme being. No one or nothing is above him. Number two, he's immutable. He's unchangeable. Number three, God is omniscient. God is all knowledge. That is what omniscient means. Knowing all things at once. There is nothing that God doesn't know. And he doesn't have to go look anything up to find something out. You know, I don't care what career you took in life. I don't care what job you have or, or whatever you did or where you went to college or whatever you do for a living. I don't care what you do. You couldn't do that unless somebody showed you how to do it. Whether it was uh, college or whether you weren't trained on a job or or your daddy showed you, your mama showed you, or whatever. You didn't know what to do unless somebody showed you. Okay? So there's nothing that God doesn't know. He doesn't have to go, God don't have to look anything up. He already knows how everything is because he created. Um, so, uh, so that's our human weakness. We have to be showed something to know how to do it. But God is not that way. He already knows how because he created it. Fortunately, you know, fortunately, we can, today's technology, we can just go on and Google something, find something out. Well, God don't even have to do that either, because he already knows it, because God knows everything. Um, number four, he is omnipresent. He is omnipresent. In other words, you cannot go anywhere, and I mean anywhere, without God being there. How do I know this? Because David, King David, in the book of Psalms, even he wrote in one of his Psalms, 
it puts them in a place that's really hard to swallow, to be honest with you. He says, Lo, I go through the deepest hell. God is there. And though I go to the highest heaven, God is there. Folks, that's, that covers everywhere. So no matter where you go or where you think you're hiding from God, you're not. Because God is omnipresent. Now that's something that Satan is not. He's not omnipresent. Satan can't be everywhere at once like God can. Uh, Satan ain't got that kind of power. But God does. God can be everywhere at once if he wants to be. You know, there's some astronomers out there that feel that our universe is always expanding outwards. But does it ever go beyond God? No, it don't. All right, number five. He is righteous. He is righteous. God is just in everything. He does. He has never treated anyone or anything unfairly, even though you might think he has, but God hasn't. Actually, the Bible doesn't say God has to be fair. It says God is just. But he has never treated anybody unfairly in any way, shape, or form. No matter what you think, if he has or he hasn't. But God doesn't treat anybody unfairly. God knows what's best for all of us. Okay, number six, his grace. His grace is also an attribute. And what we have to see here, folks, is very few people, even believers, understand the grace of God. Why is that? Because it is an attribute. God's grace goes so far above and beyond the human knowledge that it's hard for us to even comprehend. It says in the book of Hebrews, and yet his grace is always greater and will always go farther than man's greatest sin. Grace is that attribute of God that he is capable of absolutely forgiving and cleansing and calling the righteous and calling righteous the most vile sinner that will believe upon his precious son. You know, we've got a missionary in our church. He's a uh, he's, he's with the Rock of Ages, uh, Rock of Ages Prison Ministries, and he works down there in Houston. And uh, he talks to these inmates, these uh, people that come to prison. And some of the stories he's told us, you know, it's it's just uh, it's scary. But you know what? He still talks to these people about God, and uh, and some of them come to know the Lord, and that's that's a wonderful thing. But uh, he talks to he talks to murderers. You know, some people that's killed some bad. I mean, some bad murderers. You know, and if we sit and think about it and see what uh, you know what these people have done. You know, the first thing that probably pops in our head is is uh, well, he needs to be put to death, and, and uh, the sooner the better. You know, that's what we that's what we would think. But you know the way God looks at that murderer? As a man that is still capable of his grace. That's how God looks at things. Now I know that's beyond us, but that is why grace is, a, is an attribute of God. Number seven, his love. You know, there are a lot of people we can love. And there are a lot of people we don't want to love. There are poor people, and people living in poverty. But you see, there isn't anybody that God can't love. You know, you think about the ghettos up in these big cities where they're selling drugs and, and people getting killed and, and uh, this crime just runs rampant all the time. Is, is there anybody so far down in those areas that God can't love? No. We can't always comprehend, comprehend it, but God loves them, and He has already purchased their salvation. There's not anybody in time past, in times today, times in the future, as long as God tarries, that He ain't already purchased their salvation. 
Well, what have they got to do? They've got to cash in on it. They are already pardoned. A lot of people, you know, a lot of us don't realize that. We already pardoned. But, uh, even the most vile sinner is pardoned if he believes on Jesus Christ. That's the key right there. You are already pardoned if you believe on Jesus Christ. If you don't believe on Jesus Christ, then you're not pardoned. Okay, so these are all attributes of this same God who created everything. He created man, and we will see that in coming lessons. He put him in the garden knowing what he would do. And yet the moment he sinned, the very next thing that God does is put in gear the whole plan of redemption. Where he is promising the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. He's already promising that. And as some Bible scholars have put it, that began the red scarlet cord of redemption. That goes all the way through this book of Genesis. Now this is not all of the attributes of God. I can name a bunch more, but I'm just going to stop here just for the sake of time today. So if you would now, if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 6. I think this is a verse that we have to classify as one of the absolutes of Scripture and of God who we've just been talking about. We know we're living in a culture where people don't want absolutes. They don't want to hear it. But they want all restraints removed. That's what people want this day and time. But listen, there are absolutes and a sovereign God is the one who has declared them. Here is the passage. We have one of at least two absolutes. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. To please who? The God up in verse 5. For he that cometh to God must, what is the next word? He must believe. Folks, God's whole requirement for salvation is to believe. To believe in what? The gospel. And what is the gospel? You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. You must believe on Jesus Christ and his gospel. If you don't have, fi if you don't have faith, the Bible clearly says it's impossible to please God. Okay. Uh, there are three words in scripture that basically mean the same thing to believe to trust and faith these right here all mean the same thing when you trust on the word of God you are believing it and when you believe the word of God you're exercising faith and when you're exercising faith, you're trusting and believing. So do you see that? So you have to believe that he is, and in that area of believing, you must understand that he is a rewarder of them who seek him. So, as Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. So in other words, folks, God will never fail an individual. Never. You know, I just want you to think about something. Uh, say when you go to the kitchen table and you sit down, or if you just sit down in your recliner, or uh, just sit down in a chair, sit down in the chair in general. I want to ask you something. Do you examine that chair? That you're going to sit down in it? I'm going to say probably the biggest part of us don't. What do we do? We usually just sit down in that chair. So why is that? Uh, because we have the utmost faith that that chair is going to hold us up, right? You believe before you sit down 
as that chair was going to hold you up. And most of us do. We don't. If we inspect that chair, it's not because uh, to see if it's going to hold us up. That's not why we're inspecting that chair. Uh, sorry, folks. Uh, the phone's ringing. Let me get it through there. Okay, so, uh, you're going to sit in that chair. So when you, uh, sit down in that chair, you got the utmost faith that it's going to hold you up, right? So, let's put that up in the spiritual, spiritual side of it. God expects that same kind of faith he wants you to put that in him um, God expects the human race to put that same kind of faith in what he has said just as much as you place your faith in the material things to take that we take for granted it's the very same application that when God has said something we can believe it and when we believe it God is going to reward us with the greatest experience of all of human history. And what is that? Salvation. To have that blessed assurance, not only for not only of eternal life, for that which is to come, but for the here and now. You know, a lot of Christians have the idea that salvation is just simply a fire escape. They get saved, so they won't go to hell. Well, that is all well and good. And that is certainly part of it. Listen, there's a lot more to salvation than just that. And the knowledge that you're a child of God is that day-by-day -day assurance that you're His and He is yours. And how do we know that? Because the Bible says so. You know, a lot of folks believe the Bible, but they don't want to do what the Bible says. Why is that? Because it don't fit their lifestyle. And folks, I'm just as guilty as anybody is. We don't want to do exactly what God wants us to do because it's going to put a kink in our lifestyle. And uh, that's, a lot, that's the truth. That's a lot of truth in a lot of people's lives, including mine. Um, but I'm here to tell you, there's no material thing that even comes close to what God does for you. When you become fully committed to Him. And folks, there is no argument here whatsoever. If you never fully committed to God, what He can do for you. There's no material thing that can even touch it. And there's no argument there if you hadn't fully committed to Him. Because you have never seen His full power. You know, you can show people verses and you say, Do you feel this? And I know. Can you see this? No. Well, how do you know it's true then? Because the Bible says so. It's having faith, folks. <clears throat> and when you take God at His word, what is it? That's faith. When you take God at His word, that's faith. Faith is when you can read something in the Bible, in the book. I mean, let me. Faith is when you can read something in the Bible, and even though you can't understand it. You believed. Why? Because God said it. And that's what faith is, folks. And folks, that's all I've got to share with you today. Uh, I hope uh, when you understand some of God's attributes and understand what faith is. And to be fully committed to God. And folks, if, I, if I'm on here and I'm telling you I'm fully committed to God, I'd be lying to you because I'm not. And, uh, oh, I, I, just, I, I just long for that day where I can be fully committed. Uh, it just goes, everything goes, there's so much in life going on, and I don't give God the attention that He should be getting. And to be honest with you folks, I don't think there's anybody out there that is fully committed to God. But what a joy it would be. And you know, and you would know. 
your Savior to the fullest if we would fully just fully commit. And each day I get up, I try to I try to commit more and more to Him the best I best I can. And folks, as we go along through life, we need to try to do that. Just fully commit to God. Um, we really need to try to do that. And folks, I just uh, hope you've enjoyed the message of Genesis Part 2. Uh, next week will be Genesis Part 3. Uh, I'll try to give you uh, a question for the, following, for the next week. So I'm going to give you a question. Uh, this will all be fairly simple if you read your Bibles. And it is in Genesis, the first few verses of Gen Genesis, to answer this question. Um, uh, the question is, what was the first thing God created that we can actually see with the human eye? What was the first thing God created that we can actually see with the human eye? And I will give you a hint. It's something we got to have every day. Uh, we'd probably be lost without it. Uh, but the question is, what was the first thing God created that we can see with the human eye? Okay, folks, I'm going to get off here. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, uh, I'll ask that you go ahead and subscribe if you enjoy the messages. Um, and that way, when I do a new message, it'll automatically pop up on you on your phone or what have you, but uh, I'll just relay that message. I didn't know nothing about it till my daughter told me. And if you subscribe, uh, it'll automatically pop up when I do one of these videos. But anyway, folks, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, spend some time in God's Word, and if you get the chance, tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. So until next time, we'll talk to you later.